Yo, my guest this week was someone that I grew up with, but really only knew in passing. So I was super excited to speak with him and to bring our conversation to you. We were at the same high school and now we're both MBA students, but he is out in sunny, sunny California at Stanford. He was once a national level ping pong player and the kicker on my high school football team. Yes, Indian people play football. No, I'm not talking about soccer. <laughs> At 24, he was also the director of a charter school in Madison, Wisconsin. He shared some of his insights on teaching and talked about having a black role model, despite some of the anti-black sentiment within the Indian community. I found this conversation profound, and I hope you do as well. Without further ado, Vivek Ramakrishnan, welcome to Brown People We Know. Yeah, I think long time no see is a bit of an understatement at this point. Oh yeah, for sure. I thought of you the other day because I was at my cousin's house and they have a ping pong table. <laughs> That's funny, man. Yeah, I, I certainly had ping pong reputation in high school. And what's funny is I actually here in my in my room just was started hanging up jerseys and whatnot. So I got the Giannis jersey, diehard Bucks fan, got forward FC Madison. But I also have a Madison West table tennis jersey. I put together a, a team, quote unquote, for a, for a tournament we, that they did for club teams our senior year. And I still have that jersey. Yeah, you played in college as well, right? Yeah, I did. I did. I played at Columbia and I, for a couple of years, was the president of the club as well, just helping organize that. And so it was a part of my college experience as well. But I would say over time has been has been less so the case. So I think sports are actually an interesting place to start just because when I look at a lot of my friends or even my own experience, my parents had me play tennis for the purpose of getting into college. Like it was an extra curriculum that I could list on my resume. Yeah. How did you get introduced to table tennis? Even beyond that, you play, You were a kicker for the football team. You played ice hockey. Cool. So, yeah, I, I first got into table tennis because we had a, a pool table at my house that could convert into a, a table tennis top. And my uncle used to play pretty seriously growing up in India. So when he would come and visit us occasionally, he would play with my dad. And they were both pretty respectable players, especially my uncle. So I was like, wait, this is a real sport? And picked it up a little bit that way. And as a result of that, when I was around 10, we found a club in Madison that was downtown near uh, near UW's campus. And they had three tables, played a couple times a night, but it was an old school group of guys along with current UW students who were cycling in and out that played pretty frequently. So I really picked up the sport through those guys and ran with it from there. As far as the other sports... I always had a tough time giving up sports. I still remember growing up playing soccer. I would still say soccer might be my favorite sport, but I, I played soccer. I was the goalie for the ice hockey team at West, as you know, and played that from the time I was a kid. And then my junior and senior years picked up football, which I think had a lot of lasting effects on my life, which we can talk about a little bit. But I always had issues giving up a sport. And I also had issues focusing on school. I remember, you know, I was not particularly serious as a student through most of middle school. And when I got to high school, my dad told me he would pull my ass out of every sport if I didn't start taking school more seriously. And, and that was enough to make me do just that and focus a little bit more in school as well. So sports has always been a big part of my life. I never think I had serious aspirations at a certain point of, you know, playing professionally or anything. But it's just been such a big part of the social fabric and community fabric of my life as well. It sounds like a lot of it was just playing for fun, but I know you went on to found Pass It On Soccer in high school. So did you find that that was something you wanted to do because it intersected impact and sports or what was your inspiration for that? Yeah. So growing up, I, I had a soccer coach uh, named Ibrahima who was from the Gambia, which is a small country in West Africa. And I remember I was almost like a second son to him. His family was still back in the Gambia and we grew up really tight, had a really close relationship. And one of the things he told me a lot about was growing up, how they oftentimes did not have regular access to an actual soccer ball, made it out of makeshift materials. And on the other side of the globe here, I see all these friends who used to play soccer and who have all this equipment just lying dormant basically in their garages. And I was like, 
man, this is this is a simple problem to solve. We just need to fundraise the cost of shipping, but me and buddies can pick up the equipment. So it just really started more with that very simple idea. And it took me to Uganda and ultimately culminated in, in helping an organization there that I'm still very close with build a community soccer field, which was awesome. But it really just started from the simple realization that there's a supply demand gap. Yeah, like a logistics problem there. Oh, yeah. I saw impact as kind of a, a through line in your career. But before I get into that, I kind of want to chat a little bit about your family background and high school. And since you mentioned high school, I guess we might as well start there. You and I were chatting earlier about the fact that we were each one of four Indian students out of a high school of about 2,000. I know for me that resulted in like having a lot of Chinese friends because culturally I felt like I could relate. They also had the second language or second culture aspect of their life. They had like a strong emphasis on school as well. So I'm kind of curious about your friend group in high school and like how you related to people. Uh, what's interesting is I think you and I probably had very similar feelings, but in terms of how that resulted in our social lives, probably manifested itself a little bit differently. Especially once I joined the football team halfway through high school, I would really say that my relationships were pretty equally split between black and white friends. And yeah, I don't think that was an essential choice so much as a product of the extracurriculars I played. So on the hockey team, I think we had we had one other guy who was was half Latino. But otherwise, I was the only non-white kid on the team. And on the flip side, on the football team, it was majority African American and was one of the few kids who was not. So <laughs> both literally and figuratively, always found myself as the brown guy in the middle, sort of translating between two worlds. And West is a funny school because on paper, it's very diverse. But if you go into one classroom, you would think you're in one school. If you go into another classroom, you'd think you're in a totally different school. It was very internally segregated, and navigating that as somebody who didn't fall into any of the major categories was really interesting for sure. Could you give us like a little bit of your family background? I'm assuming that you grew up mostly in the States, correct? Yeah, yeah. So I was born and raised in Madison. What's funny, just touching on my family background, my parents, my dad's from Chennai originally, my mom's from Hyderabad. But my dad, when he was young, around 9, 10 years old, moved to Hyderabad. So they went to the same grammar school for several years in Hyderabad, but they did not know each other. They were a year apart, and then fast forward 10 years, they meet each other in Madison, Wisconsin, which is crazy. So that's a little uh, funny coincidence, but my dad was a professor at the University of Wisconsin in computer science, so pretty traditional background. My mom was sort of tracked into engineering from a young age in India because she had a facility with math. Her dad was an engineer himself. But that was never really her interest. So she was in the PhD program at UW, but never ended up completing it, finished with a master's, but also never worked in the field because it just was never an interest for her. So though my parents have a fairly traditional background, I, I do think I was blessed in the sense that what they told me was, in one sense, very traditional. They said, whatever you're going to do, you got to push yourself to the limit, you know, pedal to the metal, which is very typical, I think, of, of people from our background. But on the other hand, they gave both my brother and I a lot of latitude in terms of what passions we developed. We were not tracked or heavily counseled into, you know, engineering, medicine, and so on and so forth. So my brother and I both really had the opportunity to develop our passions from a young age, which I think is still at play today. Did they push for you both to retain culture? <laughs> so this was this was actually uh, a running thread of tension in my family, for sure. I think one of my biggest regrets is that I don't, to this day, speak an Indian language. You know, my mom's mother tongue is Telugu, my dad's is Tamil. Neither of them really likes Hindi. They grew up uh, learning it in school, but in many ways, they mostly communicate in English. And I do wish that that's something that, that had stuck with me. In terms of what we retained and didn't retain, language being one we didn't retain, we really did retain food. So even today when I cook, I mostly cook South Indian food. That's a big part of my life, and, and it's certainly a comfort food. Whenever I'm in a new area, i got to find a new South Indian restaurant as soon as I land there. It was interesting with my parents because my dad, though I, I don't think he identifies as necessarily being a Hindu believer, he really saw a lot of value in embedding ourselves in the culture of Hinduism and our roots. Whereas my mom to this day is more religious uh, in her practice, but was not as big about actually making sure that we were going to Indian functions or, or being a part of the community in Madison. So sort of paradoxical there, not what you would expect, 
but that was definitely something that we navigated growing up and I'm still navigating. Yeah. So then kind of circling back to the high school environment, did you feel more Indian or more American? And then kind of going back to that point of being the brown person in the middle, did you feel that or was it kind of like you blended in? No, I absolutely felt it. I think I always felt like a man without a tribe. And that felt at the time really difficult sometimes, you know? You just want that cosign, so to speak, as Hassan Minaj says, right? But there's nowhere to readily get it. And I was definitely cognizant of the fact that there wasn't a group that I naturally retreated to. Even how that played through in, in its social dynamics, I wouldn't say there was one group of friends who like had an active group text that I was a part of and I was going out with them on the weekends. That wasn't happening. I was mostly at home on the weekends, maybe seeing a friend or two here or there individually. So even though I, I knew a lot of people, I had friend groups I was part of across sort of the racial and socioeconomic spectrum at West. I didn't have a clan, so to speak, and that felt lonely at the time. But I will say, in, in retrospect, I think that's sort of a unique superpower, so to speak, because I've never had the benefit of being able to blend in and immediately just, you know, fall back on, on shared experience and culture with most spaces I've been in. I, I really have learned how to interact with and, and get along with and really form meaningful connections with people from, from a lot of different backgrounds. And that sounds, sounds sort of cliche and whatnot, but I genuinely mean it. That feels like something I'm very comfortable doing. I've always leaned into experiences that are unfamiliar, mostly because they don't seem like that large elite for me when you never really have a comfort zone to fall back into. And that has served me really well in my personal and professional life. You know what, I just remembered, I think in like December, I saw a post about your first homebrew. And you, <laughs> you had just mentioned that the Indian food has stuck with you. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's funny. So uh, I got a concussion about fourth of several, I should say. I got a concussion. And, and when you have a, a serious concussion, you're not supposed to watch TV. You're not supposed to read. You're really supposed to shut down those things that, that create sensory reaction. So I was going really bored and I was like, I, I need to find something to do. So I went to the homebrew store in Madison and was like, let me just make this. And it's sort of funny because I really like cream ales. I have a very weird like for cream ales that might be due to spotted cow. But I also really like mango being a true Indian. I, I make mango smoothies every day. Mango is just my favorite fruit, period. So I was like, I need to make a mango cream ale. So that's what I did and brewed a batch it turned out pretty well it was not it was not bad which which i was expecting it to be i could not say the same for my first cider i also went online and created a graphic image and ordered some bottle wrappings but the brand officially that lasted only a batch or two was viv's homecrafted homebrew and our subtitle was a wisconsin tradition since last month <laughs> <laughs> so it was it was fun it was a good time and it was a good good way to pick up a new hobby when i couldn't do much else yeah the mango thing is always so funny to me I got a dehydrator a while back. When I was staying at my parents' place, I would set aside some mangoes to ripen so I could put them in the dehydrator. And every time I would go reach into the rice bag, which is, you know, where they keep their mangoes, uh -huh. they would be gone. Someone ate them. <laughs> <laughs> it was impossible to, to let them get ripe. Yeah, man. Mangoes, mangoes are a hell of a fruit. Even to this day, I, I make these protein smoothies that normally, you know, you're chock full of this protein that doesn't taste good, but mango can shield anything. So I have a mango smoothie every day just because it, it's so easy and it shields the taste of protein I would otherwise not probably like. True. So I know that you started your career as a teacher with TFA and then Freedom Charter Prep Schools. What was the subject that you were teaching? And then I'm more curious about the legacy or the lessons that you wanted to leave your students. So my interest in education started actually at West. I spoke out in favor of a proposed charter school in the district that was controversial. When I was a senior, I think you were a junior at the time that was narrowly voted down. And that just sparked an interest in education that ran all the way through from the time I was 18 onwards. So I knew uh, I'd set myself up during college, you know, with my part-time job, with a professor studying education issues, from tutoring to really make that jump to the classroom. I knew pretty early on I wanted to experience that. I was always into education policy and thought, can't tell people how to teach without having taught. As far as TFA, I only really looked at regions that had major teacher shortages. I felt strongly that as a young person who didn't know how long they would be in the classroom, I really 
should not put myself in a position where I'm displacing a veteran, but rather filling an otherwise empty classroom. So I ended up in Memphis, which has a huge teacher shortage. At Freedom Prep, I was lucky to be a founding member of the 12th grade team. What that means is that it was our first year ever as a public charter school teaching 12th grade students. The same cohort had started with Freedom Prep as sixth graders, and six years later they were 12th graders, and that's when I stepped in and, and had them as a math and personal finance teacher. So the biggest things for me in terms of what I wanted to incorporate into my work was I realized maybe you have a different perspective, but I think there's so many things I learned in high school math that I have never, ever, ever subsequently used. And on the flip side, there's some things that are pretty low hanging fruit that you can start to introduce kids to in the context of a math class that'll serve them really well if they want to go to college. So I think about statistics in particular. So I really try to restructure my math course to teach statistics towards the end of the year to set kids up so they're not seeing it for the first time in college and being overwhelmed by that. Uh, at the beginning of the year, we really focused heavily on ACT math in Tennessee. If you meet certain benchmarks, meaning like an 18 or a 21, it triggers automatic scholarship money that's pretty significant to state universities. And so for a lot of my kids who were on the borderline of those scores, there was huge amounts of money at stake that would enable them to go to college with reasonable amounts of debt. So we really used the beginning part of that math course as well. And then I told you there was also a second course, personal finance. And personal finance for me, that was that was my bread and butter. That's what I love teaching. It was such an important course. And I don't know that I taught personal finance better than your average person. But the fact that I was able to teach it was itself pretty distinguishing because Tennessee is one of the few states in the country where you have to take a personal finance course. Yeah. And it must have been super rewarding, not only to be in the classroom and teaching things that these students can go on to apply, but also to see the first 12th grade class. Oh, yeah, for sure. And, you know, with personal finance, I think it was particularly rewarding because in some cases with math, there was a wide range of ability. But on the on the lower end of that spectrum, I had some students who still didn't know basic multiplication tables. The average ACT coming into the year was about a 16 in, on the math section. So there were some fundamental skills gaps that are hard to close in one year when you have students as 12th graders. But with personal finance, you could still win a lot of battles, even if a student might not understand the exponential functions behind compounding interest. If I can counsel you to avoid payday loans whenever possible, that's a battle won. So it, it felt like there was a lot of ground to cover that would actually benefit students even when they were in school, let alone afterwards. That's awesome. Were these underserved students or from economically disadvantaged backgrounds? Yeah, yeah. So TFA mostly places in schools that student populations are higher percentage of free reduced lunch, that are higher percentages than schools nationwide as far as racial minorities. So my school was almost exclusively African American. I think it was like 93, 94% African American. And low income percentage was a little lower than the typical district school, even though it was also a public school, but it was about 75% free reduced lunch. I worked at an education nonprofit before my MBA, similar to you in some sense, although I wasn't as deep into that space. But it was always so intriguing to me to look at the students and kind of compare their experience to my own as an immigrant. You know, the family sacrifices, the emphasis on education. I'm kind of curious if you saw some of that too. Yeah, what's, what's interesting is one of my biggest takeaways is how lucky you and I were to have parents who were ingraining the value of education in us from a really young age, not just the value of education, but who themselves were equipped to help us execute on that. So I came away very, very positive and impressed with how committed to education a lot of my families and parents were. But some were not equipped to help students gain those legs up that yours or mine might have been. So I think, for example, of a certain student who I think he got a 29 on the ACT math section, which was way higher than what you typically see in Memphis or, or urban schools. But I'm telling you straight up, he was better than me at math. And I got a five on the AP calculus, did well on the ACT, you know, have subsequently gone to some pretty elite institutions. And he was better than me at math. He got those concepts quicker. It came more naturally. And I'm just like, man, if he was in my household growing up with my mom, who was able to help me with Calc 3 when I came home from college, oh, he would have crushed it. And he still is doing really well, right? But I just realized that talent is equally distributed yeah, the impact of the household is really big. Yeah, for sure. 
I think the other thing that's really important to keep in mind is that sometimes what we have a tendency to do is like treat the household as an exogenous factor. It's not. What parents can bring to the table is incredibly shaped by, you know, whether they're working an overnight shift, whether they have other families or relatives whose kids they're looking after as well. All those things operate in tandem. And so not knowing where a family is coming from, it makes it really important just to to recognize that the, there are limits to what you or I can offer, right? It's not just, hey, listen, I'm from an immigrant family. We came up hard. We worked hard. We I, I know what it's like. No, we, we don't. And so recognizing the limits and transferability of our our experiences is also important, too, in engaging with those families. Having an incredible amount of respect for the family is super important. You can't be a good educator if you're not a good partner to those families. And that requires engaging with humility rather than treating yourself as like the vessel of knowledge who's there to impart it to their kid. So then you went on to work as director of strategy and operations at One City Schools. Can you speak a little bit about your relationship with Kaleem Kerr and his role in that whole process? Yeah, yeah. So if your listeners are not familiar, Kaleem Kerr is a social entrepreneur in Madison who's nationally known for his work on education reform and mostly did some national level initiatives in DC, but as a son of Madison, returned to Madison where he ran the Urban League's local chapter there. And the National Urban League's chapter in Madison is who proposed the charter school I spoke out in favor of my senior year of high school. So to bring it way back to my relationship with Kaleem, I went to this board meeting at Memorial High School and I spoke out in favor of the school that he was proposing when he was CEO there at the Urban League. And it was narrowly voted down, but afterwards he connected with me and was like, man, stay in touch. That was powerful that you as a student decided to speak. I think I was the only student who spoke actually the whole night out of a couple hundred people who volunteered to speak. And I just spoke to the experiences I saw at West as the school that on paper was diverse, but reality was a tale of two different schools based on your zip code, your background, etc. And we did stay in touch. And after my freshman year at Columbia, I was home. I was working another part-time job. And he called me up in June and said, hey, I have some work for you. And so that started our relationship. So I worked part-time at the Urban League that summer with him, just researching the need for early childhood education in Madison. That eventually led to Kaleem founding and me secondarily co-founding One City Schools when I was in college. And I helped him with, with the business plan and concept paper behind One City. And I stayed connected pretty loosely from afar, even while I was still finishing up college and teaching in Memphis. And the school was going well, the preschool was going well, I should say, and parents wanted to grow vertically as a charter school. So Kaleem asked me to, to come home and, and work full time with One City and, and run the business side of the house, which I did and was an awesome experience. And I'm, I'm lucky to call him a mentor. I'm telling you the positions I've been put in at, at a young age are a product of the trust he's put in me. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be nearly the person I am today without Kaleem's guidance from the time I was 18 years old. Yeah. It's awesome to see that this relationship was light along the years, but suddenly evolved into something much more deep and meaningful. For sure. And, and like I said, I I think that even when his own board hired me to run operations at what is effectively a startup, I mean, we're a public school that happens to be a startup, which is really challenging environment. Even his own board members were like, you're hiring a 24-year-old kid to do this? Like, are you sure, Kaleem? And, uh, you know, he stuck his neck out there for me and to put me in some central positions during a key stage of the organization. And, and I won't ever forget that. What were maybe like one or two of the biggest challenges you had in that role? <laughs> oh, man. Uh, <laughs> I'm trying to think about one or two. So... I mean, making payroll, to be honest with you, we are doing super innovative stuff. We go longer school day, longer school year, because that's how you meet parents where they're at in some ways. We have an extra teacher in every room through second grade. We have a school meals program where we cook everything in-house from scratch, but all of this adds significant cost above and beyond what the state funds us at. So we have to fundraise to make up that difference. And there were several 
several nights, you know, that I lie awake thinking about how are we going to make payroll in a day or two? So taking out bridge loans, trying to get donors who had already committed money to us to expedite actually sending us that money. My gray hairs, many of them come from from trying to make payroll. So that certainly is one. And then I think just the challenges of building a startup in what is fundamentally a more traditional sector. So we were the first ever independent charter school in Madison that is not under district control. And what that means is that we are the district, which is sort of a funny idea that 150 little school building on the south side of Madison is a school district, but that's what we were regulated as. So we had all these expectations to run as a district. We were subject to the same local, state, federal compliance, but we also had to be nimble, quick, hire, make quick decisions. It's a really tough challenge. In a typical startup environment, you can just roll and keep going. But in a school environment, you have to balance the formal constraints of being in a traditional sector like education with also the informal constraints of hiring people who are coming with the expectations of having worked in a large district and not a nimble small startup. Sure. And Viv, there's one other thing that I kind of want to touch on in light of the recent events. There's definitely a lot of anti-Black sentiment within the Indian community. I can remember when I was younger, even my dad, out of good intention, perhaps said, you know, kind of like stay away from certain people that he felt would corrupt me. And often those were Black students at West. So your relationship with Kaleem, I'm curious if that was ever scrutinized by your parents or it felt strained because of any of the sentiment in, in communities that you may have been a part of? Good question. Uh, the answer is, in my case, not at all. My parents have been extremely supportive of the work I've done, the relationship I've had with Kaleem from the get-go. I, I, it's funny you say that because I remember one time I went to a party of a family friend who was graduating from Memorial. And there was a lot more Indian kids who go to Memorial in Madison. And I was sitting around a table and people were like, oh, like you go to West, what do you do? And I said, I played hockey and I played football. And jaws dropped when I said I played football. One of his kids was like, yo, man, like I wish I could do that. Like I wanted to play basketball, but my parents didn't want me playing with all the black kids. And it wasn't a one-off comment. Other people validated that. And it just made me really sad. And to be honest with you, like I understand that this is an ongoing dialogue and we have to have grace with people. But at the same time, that's the sort of stuff that really disaffected me from the Indian American community and from my own culture. And finding Indian American friends whose values resonate with mine. My work is so core to who I am and what I do that I sometimes feel like I'm threading a needle with a culture that still has a long way to go and how it, it actually thinks about race and specifically its anti-black sentiment in this country. Where do you think that sentiment comes from in the Indian community? I do think that there are a lot of Indian folks who have worked really hard before coming here to get here and since getting here. And there's sort of this view that reduces how your life goes to, oh, if I can work hard and came from not that much materially in India, why can't those people? And what that does is it completely reduces the legacy of slavery, racism, redlining, all these systems, the legacy of which or directly continue to impact black people in this country. And it doesn't account for any of that. It's sort of an analog to what I was saying with we can't just talk about, oh, if only families did this. Like, no, families are affected by housing, by food systems, by, by food access, by health care. And if you view these things in isolation, then yeah, you can reduce it to, well, I was responsible and had individual responsibility, why can't they? But if you have an honest reckoning for the history of racism in this country and its legacy, then I think it's much more reasonable to understand why certain groups have not experienced the mobility that maybe Indian Americans have. I think there's also a selection bias. The Indians that are here are not a representative cross-section of the Indian diaspora worldwide. And in many cases, we came here under the auspices of the model minority myth, and we've continued to feed into that. A lot of the Indians who came here have come here for higher education, and we are not a representative sample. And I think we need to take note of that before we put ourselves on a pedestal. So how can we have those tough conversations with our parents or our cousins or friends within the community? Yeah, that's that might be the question that I don't have the best answer for. I will say that I was very lucky to have parents that were open to my passion, my line of work. And so I haven't had to fight those battles in the way that others might have to. And I want to just acknowledge that up front. Let me, let me speak. Let me come at it from a different angle. I would first say to 
people and you're in my position, our generation, who might say, hey, I'm supportive of Black Lives Matter, or I don't like some of the things that I see in here in today's society, walk the walk first. That doesn't mean change your profession, go teach in an urban school. That's not what I'm saying. But put yourself in a position where you are not in your comfy little bubble every day and find a place whose mission resonates with you and volunteer there regularly. Get to know the organization. Put yourself in a position where when you are speaking to your parents, you're not speaking from theory. You're not speaking from experience that you've read in a most recent Medium post, (laughs) right? Put yourself in a position so when you're speaking to your parents, you're coming with the credibility of listen. I'm going to push back against what I just heard you say because I have several examples in my own experience that tell me you are wrong. And then when you're negotiating from that position rather than from a position of theory, I think that makes the conversation, if not easier, more effective. Yeah, that definitely makes sense. Even when I look back at how I've had to navigate these, I'm now able to draw from my experiences in the nonprofit in Chicago and draw analogies to our own family experience and our own family background that I think translates into something that maybe my family can understand better. For sure. So now you're about to enter graduate school. You've worked in the education space so far. I'm curious, do you feel a pressure or a desire to stay within education post Stanford? Good question. Well, first, let me tackle sort of my entrance to grad school. From the time I took the job back home with Kaleem in one city, I put on the table before I accepted the job. I said, hey, Kaleem, I am interested in grad school. MBA might be one of the routes, might be something else. And he said, I just need somebody to come here and help me set this thing up. I will support you when you want to go. And he followed through on his word and was a major part of my application process and has been supporting me every step along the way. So there was an alignment of incentives there that I was lucky to have that might not always be the case when you're trying to negotiate when to tell your employer, when to apply, who to ask for letters of rec. There was none of that because it was all on the table from the get-go. Now, as far as now that I'm here at Stanford for my MBA, I I just started, I am interested in the space that I've been in very broadly speaking, but I also see the MBA as a generalist degree and a time to explore a little bit. So as far as what I would name as my interest, educationally is is certainly one of them but also financial inclusion, urban development, real estate a little bit, impact investing. Just broadly, I'm into social entrepreneurship. I think one of my biggest takeaways from One City is is how entrepreneurial I am. Before, I used to think of myself as a public policy guy, you know, reading a lot of econ papers on the efficacy of different interventions in urban schools, so on and so forth. But at One City, I just realized how much I loved the variety of tasks that I took on and the act of building something fundamentally from the ground up. So broadly speaking, I'm really interested in social entrepreneurship. And I think one of my other big takeaways in my last four years in education is how many things impact what students and families bring to the classroom that are adjacent to education, if not directly within the purview of schools. So we're coming up on time, Viv. I just want to congratulate you on the move and good luck with the degree. And Well, thank you for having me on. I think it's an awesome podcast you're doing, and, and I hope it continues to pick up steam as people thoughtfully navigate Indian American identity. It's a topic that is sometimes easy to to talk about in bubbles. So I think you doing a podcast even exposes people outside our community to some of the challenges and considerations that we have within it. Thanks for being on.